Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to D.G. Will's Books in La Jolla, California. Uh, tonight, we're honored to have with us Gore Vidal and Dennis Altman, who will discuss Professor Altman's new book, Gore Vidal's America. I shall introduce Professor Altman, then defer to him to introduce our distinguished guest, uh, Michelle Montaigne, Suetonius, uh, uh, Takatus, Mark Twain, and Edward Gibbon, also collectively known as Gore Vidal. <laughs> Dennis Altman is professor of politics at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. His numerous books include Global Sex, AIDS in the Mind of America, and Homosexual, Oppression and Liberation, in 2004-2005 school year, he held the Chair of Australian Studies at Harvard University. Dennis? It's both a great honor and somewhat intimidating um, to be here in what is Gore pointed out to me last week when we spoke in Los Angeles is in fact Gore Vidal's America. Um, I very much regret that we have to share that America with George Bush's America. Um, and indeed, I was reflecting that uh, in all my time in the States, which is now something like seven years in total, um, I have probably managed to spend only four days um, in <coughs> a red state, um, which either says something about my lack of adventurism as a tourist or something wise about my choice of politics. Um, but seriously, it is a great honour um, to appear with Gore Vidal and to introduce, not I suspect to introduce Gore Vidal to you, but perhaps to explain to you why I have written a book about Gore Vidal. I'm um, very aware as I am that to write a book about someone who has written so much and so profoundly as Gore has about the United States um, is in a sense to ask for trouble. Um, I should explain that this, our, we have known each other for a long time because we came together through what has become a minor but important legal case in Australian history. Um, back at the time when Gore Vidal published Myra Breckenridge um, and I was visiting the United States, um, I brought a copy of Myra Breckenridge back to Australia, which was seized at Sydney Airport by Customs, um, who regarded it as an obscene publication. Um, and this led to a court case where, interestingly, the judge in question ruled that it was indeed an obscene publication. Um, but in fact, the case had some impact in changing Australia's censorship laws, um, which of course no longer um, would ban uh, anything equivalent uh, to Myra Breckenridge. When I was approached a couple of years ago to write a book on someone in a series that Polity Press were publishing on celebrity, it struck me that the great opportunity of writing about Gore Vidal was an opportunity to reflect on the last 60 years of history in the United States. And the great advantage to an author of writing about Gore Vidal is that his work and his life have touched on almost everything of consequence that has happened in this country over the last half century. And in the book I make the claim, which I'm prepared to defend, that Gore Vidal is the most significant American writer of the second half of the 20th century. Um, and the reason, or I should now say as we're into the 21st century, of the last half century. And the reason I would say this is really for two things. One is the sheer range and virtuosity of Gore's writings. And the combination of his ability both to remind us of American history and simultaneously through some of his inventions to reimagine America and in reimagining it, to give us an image of the United States that is often more accurate than the image given by my fellow social scientists. And the other reason is, of course, Gore Vidal's own involvement as a political activist and, in many ways, as an extraordinarily important political conscience in the United States over the last 50 years. The only bit of the book I want to read um, is one paragraph, which comes right at the end. One of the, the things that I always do is, is do the indices for my own books. 
um, probably because I'm anal obsessive and don't trust other people. <laughs> and in the process of doing the index, I realized that we actually needed two indices. And so the last chunk of the book is index of fictional characters, where I note that some of these are real people who might also appear in the main index. They are listed as fictional, where they are mentioned predominantly as literary rather than historical figures. E.g., the picture of Lincoln in the novel of that name is meant to be historically accurate, whereas the Lincoln in the Smithsonian Institution is clearly an invention. And one of the great pleasures of doing the index was that Gore himself actually turned up twice as a fictional entry, um, as well, of course, as a constant presence through the book. Um, I was very tempted to include myself, um, thus giving a new twist to the meaning of the death of the author. Um, <laughs> but modesty prevailed as it rarely does, and I didn't. Um, so it's with great pleasure and pride um, that I introduce to you uh, Gore Vidal um, and look forward enormously to uh, my further explorations of Gore Vidal's America between him and this wonderful audience that Dennis has assembled here in San Diego. <laughs> The first subject that the publisher offered Dennis in the dreaded gallery of celebrity was James Dean. <laughs> I am here because I've never owned a Porsche, but <laughs> James Dean would have been a very rich source of Americana. Anyway, it's always nice to be back here. San Diego. Also to have in the room, I hope he's still in the room, Floyd Morrow. Right behind you. Right behind me. Eminem Squeeze of the, the virtuous Democratic Party. There's another one, but <laughs> neither of us have truck with that. So I thought we'd just chat back and forth. There's an awful lot to talk about these days. We live in interesting times, and um, times that seem to be getting a little sillier. I mean, watching our leader, we could use such a funny word. I'm a wartime president. There's no war. Only Congress can declare war. He can't. But he's convinced everybody that preemptive war, he can order any time he wants. And I said, well, why not why pick Iraq? Why don't you hit you know, a really pretty country like Denmark? <laughs> You'd have much better pictures. The whole world would be more annoyed at you and would, would, would hate all of us more because <laughs> we get the fallout from your foolishness. Well, I don't think that played terribly well because he has other countries in view and he, he's busy. My God, he's busy. And he does it all without looking at the geography. <laughs> but I'm told he can't read a map. Now, right off, you know, some pu curious things are going to happen, you know. My map place, you know. And uh, they tried to kill my daddy. <laughs> Aim for the sun next time. <laughs> <laughs> so when, you know, I'm basically, I suppose, uh, a satirist. But you know, satirists get exhausted when reality <laughs> just rushes out ahead of you. <laughs> and you know, I'm pretty good at thinking of silly things for people to do, but I, he confounds me. <laughs> confounds me. And he got all mixed up in this last speech he was giving you know, down in Argentina. That was really, that was a triumph, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he just, uh, then there was a mournful piece in the papers, because one of the great <coughs> mysteries is how it is that the American press has behaved so poisonously, so badly in not informing us about this regime because the regime doesn't want us to know what they're doing, so they don't tell us what they're doing. And the press, led by the New York Times, leans, as it were, upon Judith Miller, 
uh, who is not to be trusted with a weapon of mass destruction, and should have been fired, you know, for all of those stories.